Good to see you all. Glad you're all here safely, traveling through varying conditions. So yeah, it's great to, to have you here today. Uh, I got here a couple of hours ago and just spent a little bit of time uh, praying for you all and your journey here and, and also your, your heart this morning, your soul. How are you doing today? Let's not just go with, I'm fine. If anyone says to you at the end of this service for ramen tea and coffee, I'm fine, give them that look. All right? They might be fine, Pat, but I don't want to hear it. You're either rejoicing in the Lord or you're not fine. And it's okay not to be fine. You might be here in church today and this is a good place for you to be, even if you're not fine. But it's good to be honest. Predominantly, we're honest with, with God, first and foremost. Also, we can be honest with each other as well, can't we? We can tell the truth. So um, let's pray, first of all. Father, thank you so much that we are here today. Thank you that we got here, because often that can be a massive challenge. And Lord, if we're honest, sometimes we wake up on a day when we, we plan to do things for your glory. We plan to do something good. But Lord, sometimes we just don't feel like it. Sometimes it's the last thing we want to do. But Lord, we're here. We're in your house with your people. And we rejoice over that. We, we thank you for this amazing privilege. And we pray, Lord, that we would never, ever take this privilege for granted. That we would make the most of every second that we have to worship together. And Lord, for those who are here today who are not fine. Lord, I pray that your presence would be especially close to your children. Lord, and for those of us who, who are feeling a sense of rejoicing and joy today, Lord, may that be infectious across the whole fellowship. May we all know something of the joy of being a follower of Jesus today. And Lord, we pray for those who've not been able to make it today. There are lots and lots of people and well at the moment, young and old. And so, Lord, we pray for healing we pray for comfort. Lord, thank you, as somebody mentioned on Wednesday night at the, the prayer meeting, that sometimes it's in our time of illness and sickness that you draw so close, that you, you, you make us listen in many ways to what you want to say. And Lord, I pray that would be the case, that even in pain and discomfort and illness, that we would know blessing, that we would know that heaven still speaks, irrespective of the circumstances here on earth. So Lord, help us as we attempt to worship you today. We, we don't come with any righteousness of our own. We come in the righteousness of Jesus. We come by your Spirit, prompted by your Spirit, to worship and praise you, Father. Um, and we pray all these things for your glory's sake. Amen. Amen. Okay, let's stand and sing our first hymn this morning. What love, my Lord, would bring you down to earth.
Praise God. Okay, a couple of quick announcements. Um, entirely up to you what you all do with Christmas cards, obviously. Um, but for those who would prefer not to send 4.2 million cards out to everyone, um, there is an A3 sheet on the notice board in the foyer. So if you'd just like to write a little message to your church family, please feel free to do that on the board. We don't want people feeling pressured, especially, you know, we're a bit of a larger congregation now. It is a lot of pressure, a lot of money um, to do that. So as an alternative to giving Christmas cards to everyone, you can write a little note, okay? And if we run out of space, I'll print off another one. It's not a problem, okay? It could be as long or as short as you want. So uh, please make use of that in the foyer. Um, once the service is finished, if we can leave this main uh, chapel room as quickly as possible because the children are going to come down and practice and go through a full rehearsal of their nativity, which is a week today. So very exciting. Children, we're all praying for you. Okay, don't let us down. We expect <laughs> big things. The standard's been up there in recent years. Okay, no pressure. Okay, so if we can do that. Um, carol service next Sunday evening, and it's five o'clock, not six o'clock, okay? We did not consider the World Cup final when we planned this, <laughs> all right? And uh, to those of you really kind people who asked me a couple of weeks ago how Wales got on in the World Cup, um, <laughs> I think I missed the England game, the result last night, the end, but how did England get on? <laughs> okay. They played very well. Okay, yeah, yeah. Played well and lost. Okay. <laughs> Moving on. Thank you very, very much to everyone that helped out distributing the Christmas cards throughout the village on Friday morning and yesterday morning. So we've delivered about 400 um, throughout the village. Okay, and uh, we've got a fantastic postman here as well who helped us with one of the roads where the houses are really spread apart. Um, so thank you, Kay, as well, for, for speaking with with him for that. Um, so yeah, please pray. Please pray in this next, especially this next seven days, uh, next 14 days really, that people from the village would come along to the nativity or the carol service or Christmas day um, and that they would receive a, a warm welcome but most importantly they'd meet with Jesus. That's what we're praying, isn't it? That lives would be transformed, that there's hope for those who don't know eternal life, who are still in the darkness. So, um, but thank you everyone who braved the cold the last couple of days delivering. Much appreciated. Okay, I'm going to hand you over to John now, who's going to speak to the children. Do you need the mic, John? Or?
getting close. You see, I think of Christmas of giving and receiving. But you see, of all the gifts that you're going to have this Christmas time, whatever that gift is, no matter how expensive that gift is, nothing better than this gift. Because if I open the box carefully, it tells me this. That is the greatest gift that you and I can receive. God's Son, Jesus Christ. And I'm glad that when I was just a bit older than most of you, I was spoken to. And God's Son became my Savior. And I've done lots of things in life that I've enjoyed. Lots of things. But the best thing that happened to me, the very best by far, was when I asked Jesus Christ to become my Savior. That's one thing I've never regretted. And I want you to know giving his life upon a cross. He loved you, he died for you, and he wants you to become one of his children. So you just think about this. Of all the gifts you receive, there is one that will be greater than them all, and that's the gift of Jesus. And that's what Christmas is about. It's not about Christmas trees, it's not about lights, it's not about plum puddings, it's not about turkey, it's not about anything else. Christmas is about Jesus, and he loves us, and he died for us, the greatest gift of all. Don't worry about that, John, it's all right. Thank you very much. <coughs> Keep away from them sweets. <laughs> I'll try, I'll try. Thank you, John. Oh, we're going to stand and, and sing again now. And then at the end of this song, uh, the children are going to go out to, to Sunday school and crash. Let's stand together and sing, Be Thou My Vision.
Okay, let's turn to God's Word now. Exodus chapter 33 is our text for today. I'm going to read the whole chapter. But before we read God's Word, let's pray for the children. Lord, we thank you so much for the children that you've brought here this morning, uh, those that you bring here every week. Lord, we pray that you would speak to them. Lord, that this preparation for the nativity service um, wouldn't just be a performance, Lord, but it would be something that they can relate to, something where they, they think about putting themselves in the shoes of, of someone like Mary or Joseph or, or someone that was there at that time. And Lord, I pray that they are amazed that Christmas centers around just a little baby, but a baby who grew up to be a savior. And Lord, we we pray for all these children, Lord, that you bless them, that you'd speak to them, that they would grow in their faith, those that have already made professions of faith, and Lord, that you would save them and just really encourage them today. Lord, help us to learn from the children. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Exodus chapter 33, verse 1. The Lord said to Moses, Depart, go up from here, you and the people whom you've brought up out of the land of Egypt, to the land of which I swore to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, saying to your offspring, I will give it. I will send an angel before you, and I will drive out the Canaanites, the Amorites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. Go up to a land flowing with milk and honey, but I will not go among you, lest I consume you on the way, for you are a stiff-necked people. When the people heard this disastrous word, they mourned, and no one put on his ornaments. For the Lord had said to Moses, say to the people of Israel, You are a stiff-necked people. If for a single moment I should go up among you, I would consume you. So now take off your ornaments, that I may know what to do with you. Therefore the people of Israel stripped themselves of their ornaments from Mount Horeb onward. Now Moses used to take the tent and pitch it outside the camp, far off from the camp, and he called it the tent of meeting. And everyone who sought the Lord would go out to the tent of meeting, which was outside the camp. Whenever Moses went out to the tent, all the people would rise up and each would stand at his tent door and watch Moses until he had gone into the tent. When Moses entered the tent, the pillar of cloud would descend and stand at the entrance of the tent and the Lord would speak with Moses. And when all the people saw the pillar of cloud standing at the entrance of the tent, all the people would rise up and worship each at his tent door. Thus the Lord used to speak to Moses face to face as a man speaks to his friend. When Moses turned again into the camp, his assistant Joshua, the son of Nun, a young man, would not depart from the tent. Moses said to the Lord, See, you say to me, bring up this people, but you've not let me know whom you will send with me. Yet you have said, I know you by name, and you have also found favor in my sight. Now, therefore, if I have found favor in your sight, Please show me now your ways, that I may know you, in order to find favor in your sight. Consider, too, that this nation is your people. And he said, My presence will go with you, and I will give you rest. And he said to him, If your presence will not go with me, do not bring me up from here. For how shall it be known that I have found favor in your sight, I and your people? Is it not in your going with us? so that we are distinct, I and your people, from every other people on the face of the earth? And the Lord said to Moses, This very thing that you have spoken I will do, for you have found favor in my sight, and I know you by name. Moses said, Please show me your glory. And he said, I will make all my goodness pass before you, and will proclaim before you my name, the Lord, and I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and I will show mercy on whom I will show mercy." But he said, you cannot see my face, for man shall not see me and live. 
And the Lord said, Behold, there is a place by me where you shall stand on the rock, and while my glory passes by, I will put you in a cleft of the rock, and I will cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Then I will take away my hand, and you shall see my back, but my face shall not be seen. Well, we're going to stand and sing again now before we look at that chapter together. Rock of ages, cleft for me. We're going to look at three points and break this chapter up a little bit. I am a Baptist after all. So firstly, the offer and response, and secondly, Moses the mediator, and then finally we're going to look at the glory of God. So first, let's look at this offer from the Lord. It starts really, really well, this chapter, um, incredibly well actually, because despite everything that the Israelites have done to displease God, he's still keeping his promises. And finally, they would get to leave the wilderness and they would enter the land flowing with milk and honey. This resembles the promised land. So this is it. This is their moment. And and not just that they'll enter the promised land, but their route to the promised land will be easy. The Lord will clear a pathway so all of their enemies will be dealt with. An angel will go ahead of them, clear the way. That's fantastic. This is incredible news. And that's what we all want, isn't it? A peaceful, easy pathway to the promised land. I'm sure that's what a lot of us pray for. And it seems like everything is going to work out after all. It's just only one little problem. God isn't coming. He says, I'm not coming. Because you're a stiff-necked people. 
This is not a physical issue. They don't need a physiotherapist or anything like that. This is a spiritual issue. They need to repent. It requires a repentant heart. And pride is the number one cause of being a stiff-necked person. It's a refusal to turn. You're, you're like a, a stubborn mule, God says. You just won't turn around, won't, won't turn from your own ways. Your neck, your neck is so stiff. You're just like, no, I can't. I can't turn because this way I'm going is right. So God says, I can't come with you. Because if I come with you, I'll destroy you. I'll consume you. This is an act of love in itself. God's saying, I, I want to be close to you. I love you. I want to preserve you and bless you. So I can't come with you. Because you're stiff-necked, because you want to do your own thing, what's the point in me coming with you anyway? And if I come with you, your sin will be so there in my face, I might end up consuming you. Now, this is not God's way of saying he's got a temper problem and he can't control himself. This is that anthropomorphic language that we've talked about many times. So it's the Bible speaking in a, a human-ish way to help our limited minds grasp what's going on here. And God's saying to his people, it's for your own benefit that I don't come. Because if I do, I could destroy you. And that would be a righteous response to their sin. It'd be what they deserved. But God still wanted to be close. But the signs of tension, they're, they're there in verse 1. So even though it, it looks like it, it starts really well, this chapter... The tension's there because we see the relationship between God and the Israelites. It's not what it should be because he doesn't say my people, does he? He says the people. It's not good. And in verse 2, he doesn't say I'm going to send my angel or the angel of the Lord. He says I'm going to send an angel. That's not good either. And so the result is verse 3, I'm not coming. And God uses the same language here as he did back in chapter 25 when he was telling the people about, or telling Moses specifically about building the tabernacle. He said in verse 8, have them make a sanctuary for me and I will dwell among them. And he's now saying to Moses, I can't dwell among them. They're a stiff-necked people. I cannot dwell among them. And the tabernacle and the pillar of fire and the pillar of cloud, these are all signs of God's presence. But the chapter before in chapter 32 tells us that the Israelites chose to replace God's presence with a golden calf. And that's what they decided to worship. They wanted something shiny, something that they could see, they could worship directly. And that idolatry has caused God to say, you can have it, you can have the promised land, it's yours, but I'm not coming. You're on your own. And so how do the people respond? Well, First of all, I think it's important for you to ask yourself that question this morning. How would you respond if you were Moses? If God said, I'm going to offer you a clear pathway. A clear pathway to heaven on earth. Blessing without relationship, but without responsibility. Maybe that's what you want deep down. You want prosperity, you want peace, but you just don't want God. You just want his stuff. Well, the reaction of the people is disaster. It says in verse 4, when the people hear this disastrous word, they mourned, and no one put on his ornaments. So this seems like genuine repentance. It seems like the people are really sorry. They're not just feeling sorry for themselves. They're, they're sorry for what they've done. It's a bit like when um, Jacob renewed the covenant at Bethel and he told everyone, look, he told his family first and foremost, take off your jewelry, bury it. Take that off, just bury it away. Uh, by taking off jewelry, it, it represents taking off what's not good, a hindrance, a sin, or something that would cause us to sin. And the picture is this, that when we've got something in our lives that, that we know is causing us to sin or is a problem for us, is causing us to, to worship idols, we take it off and we bury it so that we can't find it again. We don't just say, oh, just put it by there. Because if we just put it within grasp, what are we likely to do? 
just pick it up again and put it back on. So there's this imagery of, of burying it, getting it out of sight, out of sight, out of mind, dealing with it, bury it. Don't keep going back to it. Don't keep putting on that, that rubbish stuff. Otherwise, we're going to be stiff-necked and we're just going to worship that stuff. And God says, look, if you don't do that, if you don't take that off, that old self or that, that idolatry, that sin, and bury it, and you keep going back to it, you're a bit like a dog that pukes up and then keeps going back to its own sick. So to us, it looks like, well, no, I'm just putting on some nice jewellery. It's not about the jewellery, but whatever it is, we, I'm, just, I'm just doing that. It's quite a nice thing. That's a beautiful thing that I'm doing. To God, we're in the pigsty. It's a pigsty moment, prodigal son. It's, it's returning to vomit. It's disgusting. Now, in chapter 35, we see the positive side of, of jewellery and wealth and all that stuff because they, they use their wealth to build the tabernacle. So it's really, really encouraging and positive. And, and what we do with our money is a good sign. It's a good spiritual indicator of, of where we're at, where our heart is, as Jesus says in Matthew chapter 6. It reveals where your heart is, where your treasure is. So that's the response. It seems genuine repentance. So we might expect the next little section to be God saying, excellent, you've repented of your sin. I forgive you. I'm coming with you. Fantastic. But that's not the next section. Instead, the next section shifts in verse 7 to 11 to Moses. Moses the mediator. And that's what we're going to look at next. It tells us that Moses regularly met with God, but it wasn't inside the camp. It was outside the camp. It's very, very clear, the text on that. Moses had to go away from everybody else. He had to go outside the camp, meet with God there, but not with everyone else, just Moses. He was the only one. And this tent of meeting was a good distance away from everyone else. And this was because the Israelites are under divine judgment. But, uh, oh, and when also, when they do end up building the tabernacle, there's that inner bit inside. And what was that called? The tent of meeting. So this is a place where God meets with a person. And this little detail, it, it helps to kind of ease the tension a little bit because there's at least one man who could come into the presence of God. Just one. And when Moses entered that tent, the pillar of cloud would come down from heaven, cover the entrance, and Moses talked with God. Now, we know from last week that this is not the first time that Moses talked with God. Exodus 3, burning bush, Moses talked with God then. They had a conversation. That wasn't the last time either. Moses went up to the holy mountain and talked with God. But on both those occasions, Moses could see no form, no image of God. In Exodus 3, it was through flames. He heard God's voice through the flames. When he went up to the holy mountain, it was covered in thick darkness. So Moses couldn't see God, but he could hear him. There was a conversation taking place. But now, it seems that progression has been made. Something's changed because it says that, no, when Moses went out to meet with God at the tent of meeting, away from the camp, he met with him face to face. Now, this is not just anthropomorphic language. This is literally face to face. And we know that because of what God says later in the chapter. But this is where it can all get a little bit confusing. <laughs> because you think, hang on. At the end of chapter 33, he says, you can't see my face. In the beginning of chapter 3, he says, Moses met with the Lord face to face. <laughs> What's that about? And it's only when we realize that there are two persons referred to as Lord in chapter 33. There are actually three persons referred to as Lord. We don't have to go far. We only go to chapter 35. And there is a person referred to as Lord who is not seen, but inhabits and empowers the craftsman to build the tabernacle. And that's the Holy Spirit. But these two persons referred to as Lord here, one is the unseen Lord. You cannot see his face. The other is the seen Lord, who you can apparently see his face. You think, oh, 
We'll come back to that in a minute. So God is meeting with Moses, but he's not meeting with the people. But he can still love the people, and he can still guide the people through this mediator, through this chosen one man. And that's what he's choosing to do. And it's for the people's good. They might be uncomfortable, they might be upset about this, this is disastrous to them, but it's for their own good. But where is our tent of meeting today? Where do you meet with God today? Do you have to go through a priest, a mediator like Moses? No. You have to go through the mediator, Jesus. But you don't have to go to anywhere in particular. I know many of you say that you particularly feel the presence of God when you come to church on a Sunday. Hallelujah. Praise God. Same for me. But we're not, it's not exclusively in church on a Sunday, is it? You can meet with God lying on your bed, sat on the sofa, driving in the car on the way to work, doing the dishes, wherever you are, whatever you're talking about, whatever you're doing, whatever your circumstances, you can meet with God. You have that privilege. And your inner sanctuary is in your soul. The Holy Spirit is living in you. That's your holy of holies. Ephesians 3.16 says, Out of his glorious riches, he, that's God, may strengthen you with power through his Spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And Jesus says, I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. I'll be with you always to the very end of the age. So God clearly wants a deeper relationship with us. He wants it to be meaningful. But he won't turn a blind eye to your sin. He had to deal with that. And that's why, as John told us earlier, that's why he sent his son. To live the perfect life and die on the cross for our sin. To bring us in relationship with God. So our relationship with God is through that one mediator, Jesus. And Moses represents that gives a vivid picture to the Old Testament church family of how it works with God. And then Moses teaches us something else really, really important about prayer, about how we pray, but also how Jesus prays for us as well. So I think we can can take both. So have a look at verse 12 to 17 again. So Moses is like, You haven't told me who's coming with me. Because if it's just a a run-of-the-mill angel, not having it. Not good enough. And we see this immense boldness from Moses as he's speaking to God. He's not being irreverent. He hasn't forgotten who he's speaking to. Remember back Exodus 3, the Lord said to him, take your shoes off because the ground where you're standing is holy. He saw the flames. He's been up on the mountain, the thick darkness. It was so intimidating for all the people. They said, can you tell God not to speak to us? It's too frightening. You just speak to us, Moses, because you're a bit more normal. Scary meeting with God. So Moses is not being irreverent here, but he's bold. And he's praying the promises of God. He's interceding. He's a mediator on behalf of the people. And he's saying, look, A normal angel? I thought we were friends. I thought we knew each other. I thought we had a relationship. I thought it was deep. And you know me, and I know you. What more do I need to know about you for you to come with your people? And and the word know, as we've mentioned many times, it's not about intellectual knowledge. It's a relational word. So it's about knowing someone on a deeper level. Moses wants to know more of the God that he knows, knows him inside out. And Moses starts to pray these promises of God. And verse 14 is absolutely incredible. It's a wonderful answer to Moses' prayer. God says, I'll go with you. My presence will go with you. God says yes. That's amazing, isn't it? When you, you pray and God answers with a yes very, very quickly, rejoice. This is fantastic. There's only one little small issue. You is singular in that verse. So God is saying to Moses, I will go with you and only you, Moses. Just you. Good for Moses. Not so good for the stiff-necked people. 
how would you react if you were Moses? Be honest. I'm in. See ya. <laughs> you lot are on your own. <laughs> know where I'm going. God's coming with me. Every man for himself. Or would you react how Moses does in verse 15 to 16? Because this is one of the most unselfish, godly, interceding prayers that we get in the whole Bible. If your presence will not go with me, do not bring us up from here. For how shall it be known that I have found favor in your sight, I and your people? Is it not in your going with us so that we are distinct, I and your people, from every other people on the face of the earth? So unselfish. He's like, they need you too. Not just me. They might not show it, and I know they, they mess up, but they need you. They desperately need you. They don't want the promised land without the promise maker. They want you, not just your stuff. And Moses acknowledges something really important that we have to know as Christians. He asks the question, what, what distinguishes us from everyone else? What, what do you think distinguishes you? If you're a follower of Jesus, if you're a Christian, what distinguishes you from somebody in this village who doesn't know Christ? Are you nicer? Are you kinder? Are you cleverer? Are you better at making quiche? What is it? <laughs> Do you rock the socks and sandals better than anyone else? No, of course not. What distinguishes you from an unbeliever is that you have the presence of God in your life. Without him, you're no different to anyone else, nor am I. We're just like everyone else. One Christian writer says this. This is the great divide that runs down the center of the human race. On one side are the people who make their own way through the world, relying on their own talents and pursuing their own goals, but God is not with them. On the other side are those who depend on God's grace and live for God's glory. God is with them. Indeed, he is everything to them. And what makes the distinction between those who have God and those who don't is faith in Jesus Christ. This is the great divide in line. Some people have forgiveness for their sins and some don't. Some people have eternal life and some don't. Some people have ultimate peace when they face suffering and death and some don't. The difference is that some people belong to God by faith in Jesus Christ and others don't. But anyone who wants the comfort of God's presence can have it. There is no need to stay outside. All that God requires is faith in Jesus Christ. What a beautiful way of putting it. And I couldn't put it better than that. That's why I read it. So Moses is saying to God, it's got to be me and your people, but he realizes something really important. He realized that, yes, God's, God's favor is linked to his promises, and, and, and repentance is essential in all this, but Moses, his own personal relationship with God is somehow linked to God's relationship with other people that Moses is representing. And here's where Moses becomes this Christ-like mediator. Verse 17, the Lord said to Moses, this very thing that you have spoken, I will do for you, singular you. For you have found favor in my sight, and I know you by name. Singular again. So God is saying to Moses, this is not about the people, this is about you. Because of you and my relationship with you, I will come with, with all of you. So God is extending his love to Moses, through Moses, to all the people that are following Moses. And now we see even clearer, that's 
how we have a relationship with the Father through the mediator, Jesus. So God's favour upon Jesus, so that, that picture that we get at Jesus' baptism where, where heaven breaks open and the Father says, this is my Son with whom I am well pleased. His favour, His blessing, because Jesus is perfect. That's how God sees you if you're a follower of Jesus you get the benefit, that overflow of blessing that comes to Jesus. That belongs to you because you follow Jesus. You trust in him. Last point, the glory of God. Uh, at this point in this little prayer intercession, I think we would have bailed out. 99% of us would have taken those answers, those really quick answers to prayer. We'd be gone. We'd be like, get in. Can't believe he said yes. So quick as well. Amazing. Moses takes it the next stage. He's not content with that. And his final prayer request is, show me your glory. God's glory is his, his radiance, his splendor. It, it's who, your glory is who you truly are at the core. So if you cut through somebody and you could see all of their attributes and who they are, all the hidden stuff was unfolded. That's your glory. And Moses says, show me your glory. Do we, as followers of Jesus, have a passionate pursuit for the glory of God? Because we should. Do we live for the glory of God? Because we should. Do we ask ourselves that question when we wake up in the morning, how am I going to glorify God today? Because we should. Like planets, we're supposed to revolve around the sun. That's our pathway, that's our purpose, and that's the pathway to an abundant life. And Moses, the way he is in this chapter, it should captivate, he should captivate us. He should motivate us so much because he is sold out for the glory of God. He just wants to pursue his relationship with God, and not in a selfish way either. That's really clear from the text. He wants to know more of God and deepen his relationship with him so that it benefits other people as well. Because he knows that overflow, others who are near to Moses will benefit from that. And that's what he wants. And if you read books about the glory of God, you, you may see theologians who describe it in two different ways. So they'll talk about the ascribed glory, which is kind of how we glorify God, how we acknowledge that God is glorious. But then the books will also talk about the intrinsic glory of God, which basically we can't add to that. That's who God is. So when we study the attributes of God and his love and his grace and his patience and kindness, who God is, he's glorious. He is utterly glorious. And so Moses is saying to him, show me your glory. I want to know more of your sovereignty, your love, your your grace, all that stuff. Because the more that we know about his intrinsic glory, the more it should motivate us to ascribe glory to him. But here's the problem. What stops us from doing that? Pride. Sometimes we think, I think I know enough about God. I know enough to be saved, so maybe that's just enough. That's fine. Let's just leave it there. I'm not talking about information here. I'm talking about knowledge that brings transformation. Transformation in you and then adoration for God. Because the Bible says the heavens declare the glory of God. So how much more glorious is the one who created those heavens? Wow. He's glorious. <coughs> Now Moses, he'd met with God face to face, he'd had the burning bush, he'd had the victory over Pharaoh, he'd had the Red Sea escape, he'd had the Mount Sinai meetings, he's had these tent meetings face to face, and he's like, that's not enough. I want more. I want to know more of you. Moses is a God chaser and a God glorifier, and he's an incredible example to us. He goes a bit far, because he says, I want, essentially he says, I want to see the unseen Lord can't. Not yet. 
One day we will see the Father's face. But this wasn't the time. So instead, God, God proclaims, he, he reveals his name, he reveals his nature. We know that he's good and gracious and merciful. And he, he says he's the Lord, he is who he is. He's self-existent. But my face, at this moment, my face shall not be seen. But all through the Bible, people knew that they could see God. Some of them did see the seen Lord, the pre-incarnate Christ, Jesus. Job said, in my flesh, I will see God. I myself will see him with my own eyes. I, and not another. How my heart yearns within me. And then he gets to the end of Job and he says, now I'd heard about you, but now my eyes have seen you. Wow, I repent in dust and ashes. He got to see God, but not the Father, not yet. David said, I, in, in righteousness, I will see your face when I awake. I will be satisfied with seeing your likeness. But listen to these words in John 14. Philip said, Lord, show us the Father and that will be enough for us. Jesus answered, don't you know me, Philip? Even after I've been among you for such a long time, anyone who's seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. We have seen his glory. Light has shone in our hearts to give us the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. And Hebrews 11 tells us that Moses, the only reason he got through all this was because he trusted in Christ. By faith, Moses, when he'd grown up, refused to be known as the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He chose to be mistreated along with the people of God Rather, to, that rather than to enjoy the fleeting pleasures of sin, he regarded disgrace for the sake of Christ as of greater value than the treasures of Egypt because he was looking ahead to his reward. By faith, he left Egypt, not fearing the king's anger. He persevered because he saw him who is invisible. Moses saw the unseen God. So just briefly to finish, how... Are we going to apply this to our lives this week? If you're not a Christian and you're here this morning, it's amazing to have you with us. You're, you're very, very welcome to be here. But I think it'd be good for you to consider the offer that God makes you. To put yourself in, in Moses' shoes, the people's shoes here. Because you could say, well, you, I'll have a lovely life on earth. I have lots of nice things. I don't need the presence of God. You could say that. Or you could say, I am not taking another step in this life without you. I need God in my life. Not just what you can give me, just you. Just you. You don't need to impress him. You don't need to earn his affection. You just need to sort out your stiff neck. That's it. You just need to turn to him, call out to him. And even if you've already made a commitment to follow Jesus, but you know deep down, if you're being honest, you know that you've chased after his presence rather than his presence, if you know what I mean. His stuff rather than him. And you can sort out that stiff neck as well. You can reaffirm your love for Jesus today. You can follow him afresh. And maybe... You can learn something from this chapter on being an, an intercessor. Maybe you know someone who's a bit stiff-necked at the moment. They're a bit lost in pride. They're a bit lost in sin. They're not calling out to God. Maybe they've got no interest in his presence at all at the moment. You can intercede for them. You can pray the promises of God. You can bring them before the throne. It's an amazing privilege we have as Christians. We don't just pray for ourselves, do we? We don't just pray, oh, I want to know more of you, Lord. It's, what about them? Who, who are we bringing before the throne of grace today? And finally, how can we bring glory to God? How can we do that practically? Well, when we receive good things, when we do good things, who takes the credit for it? Who do we ascribe the credit to? 
That was a great meal you cooked. That was a great song you sang. That was a great sermon you preached. Is our response, oh yes, well, I am rather good at that. (laughs) Or do we give the glory to God? Do we acknowledge who deserves the credit? Who is the only one who is truly good? We don't say, oh yeah, I'm really good at that. We say, to God be the glory, great things he has done. So loved he the world that he gave us his son who yielded his life and atonement for sin and opened the life gate that all may go in. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Let the people rejoice. Come to the Father through Jesus the Son. Give him the glory. Great things he has done. Moses had such a close relationship with the Lord, he saw so much glory, it almost killed him. But he was protected by the rock who shielded him, and that rock is Christ. I do not want you to be ignorant of the fact, brothers and sisters, that our ancestors were all under the cloud and they all passed through the sea. They were all baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. They all ate the same spiritual food and drank the same spiritual drink, for they drank from the spiritual rock that accompanied them, and that rock was Christ. So let's stand and sing and give glory to God. Hark, the herald angels sing. Glory to the newborn King, the King who is Jesus. King of kings, let's stand together.
Our Lord, we give you all the glory today. We thank you for Jesus. We thank you that this Christmas we can celebrate a Savior who came to this earth, a Savior who has always been, and yet a Savior who humbled himself to the point of taking on humanity to be just like us. Wow, what immense glory this world has seen. Lord, we pray for those who have no relationship with Jesus. Please, would you save their souls this Christmas time? Please, Lord, would you reach out and throw and overwhelm these people with your love? And we pray this all so that you would receive the glory that you deserve. In Jesus' name, amen.